Welcome to Frank Wealth Insights, a financial and investment podcast from Return on Life Wealth Partners. They look at your money. We look at your life at returnonlifewealth.com. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of Frank Wealth Insights Podcast. I'm your host, Frank Fantosi. And today joining me is uh, one of our very first clients and a dear friend of mine, Tim Miller, as we're celebrating not only uh, Happy New Year, uh, our 30th year in business and you know our professional relationship and friendship over the last 30 years. So on today's episode, we're going to be talking with Tim and how he found, at that time, Plan Financial Services, now Return on Life Wealth Partners, and you know what went into his decision-making process all those years ago, and also talk about you know, wealth management practice, how the industry has evolved over the last 30 years and whatever else comes up. So with that, welcome, Tim, and Happy New Year. Thanks, Frank. Thanks for having me. So let's just start out. How were your holidays? We're just coming off of uh, Christmas and a new year. How was uh, the holidays with, um, you know, Brian, Olivia, and Emma, your, your first grandchild and her first Christmas? Oh, uh, it was great. Great. It was, uh, the holidays are always nice, but uh, with the new granddaughter, it, uh, even a little more special. That's great. Well, you know, families were what it's all about, and I know how passionate I'm about your your family. And uh, again, we're excited to talk about you know some of the topics we've laid out earlier. So, give us a little background on yourself and Leslie, and you know, kind of a little timeline if you don't mind. Sure. Well, Leslie and I have been married 40 years now. Congratulations. Thanks. We start. We were married in uh, 1983. We lived in Parma Heights for about eight or nine years, and then moved to Brexville. Actually, we said that was one of, one of the best things we ever did was move to Brexville. And um, shortly after we moved there, in the mailbox was a flyer. And the flyer was from you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even remember what the flyer said. Do you remember? I don't no, remember. I don't remember. But it, <laughs> what, what it was was you were apparently starting up your new business, and you were offering tax uh, preparation services. Yeah. And I, I, I am a dope when it comes to taxes, and so uh, I wanted to. I latched onto that. We were looking for somebody who could could help us with, it, with uh, preparing our taxes. So uh, you've been doing it for forever since, and uh, <laughs> well, hopefully, it doesn't feel like forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it it's been a big help. So uh, that's that's how we got hooked up. Yeah, I think I remember. Using uh, our, our, our tax angle as a, a possible way of getting new clients because I, I started the company back in ni- 1994. January was our basically opening the doors. And just to give a little you know history prior, because now people didn't know how it came to that. You know, I was in public accounting since 1987. Worked at Arthur Anderson, which was at the time the Big Eight. Um, worked at a couple large local uh, firms and started doing more financial planning work at these firms. And I really found out my desire was to do more wealth management because I felt I could be a bigger help to clients than just once a year when I do their, you know, their tax work and and tax planning. Uh, And also felt that tax planning is a a big part of wealth management. It's one of those things that, you know, reduces your wealth if you don't manage your your taxes right. So I I resigned back in um, May of, of 1993 and then tried to figure out how I wanted to start. Well, first of all, in the beginning, I wanted to get in the industry. So I was exploring relationships with warehouses. You know, warehouses are like, you know, Merrill Lynch at the time, UBS, and some of the companies that were are no longer with us. And, um, you know, looked at insurance agencies because a lot of um, insurance companies were doing wealth management before even the warehouses were doing it. Um, the problem is I couldn't find a fit. Uh, and, and the biggest reason is coming out of public accounting, they were very numbers and planning driven. And at that time, and I, I know it might not seem as long ago, it seems a long time for me, but wealth management or financial planning really was kind of reserved for the ultra high net worth. Part of it was technology, part of it was paying for the services, and, that, and they started moving downstream. So really in the 90s, wealth management or financial planning, people use those, those terms interchangeably, um, started to move mainstream. And a lot of these companies were really, in my opinion, playing lip service. And for myself, starting a firm, I wanted that to be very central. The, the sexy part of our business is always the investments, because that's what you, you hear in the news all the time. And um, so once I, I 
figured I couldn't find a fit, I decided to just start my own firm. You know, now much to my wife's chagrin because, you know, she was, uh, you know, pregnant, um, you know, a couple, couple months I quit, you know, working and, uh, you know, starting a new business, which didn't make, you know, my wife's a little more risk averse than us, but I really knew I wanted to do this. And I just, you know, started in January. And, uh, I remember putting flyers in mailboxes in Brexwell, figured to start local and see what would happen. And I know a lot of our clients in the early years came from using the tax flyer as a way to get people to come in, talk about their taxes, and then open the door to have conversations about other things, you know, insurance planning, investment planning, financial planning. So, so if you recall at the time, obviously the, 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 the linchpin, you know, that started it was a tax planning. Um, what are the things were on your mind as well? I mean, you know, after we discuss with you, we, we do financial or wealth planning. Yeah, well, we didn't have a whole lot of money back then. We were uh, we moved to the Brexville and we were uh, had a new baby and uh, needed insurance coverage. So I think the next step that we took was uh, some insurance uh, um, policies that we, that uh, you hooked us up with. Uh, that helped, mm -hmm. um, uh, and over the years, as my career became a little more successful, I, we were able to, to venture into some some investment strategies as well. Okay. Yeah, so I, if I you know remember it all too, as well, as we started to build the foundation blocks, make sure right. your protection planning was in place, um, your your reserves, uh, your your liquid investments that we you know helped you figure out to keep at at the banks built out the protection planning, and then slowly, as your you know, discretionary income Im improved, we started developing, you know, investment strategies to help you plan for retirement, which was a big thing, mm -hmm. outside of, you know, providing, I think, you know, education to Brian uh, in regards to, you know, his endeavors when he was going to graduate high school. Right. So, uh, yeah, Brian ended up going to uh, College of Worcester, and we were able to, we had some, some funds uh, set aside for that, which was nice. Then there was another thing that you helped us with that I'm really grateful for is um, Leslie's father passed away a few, uh, a couple years ago, but he had Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And um, that was something and that we were, uh, long-term care is something that was on our mind. Right. And, and you hooked us up with uh, long-term care uh, insurance policy that uh, really, uh, Put our mind at ease yeah. when it comes to that. Yeah, it's a big it's a big cost and a, a, a big risk. And, and and when you get into retirement planning, a lot of the protection planning shifts for, from life insurance, where you're trying to provide instant cash to deal with you know loss of a loved one, pay off debts, you know, provide cash to when you get into a care situation, whether it's um, long term care or assisted living or at home care. That there are funds available to not drain out, you know, your your retirement plan to put your retirement plan at risk, or, you know, a lot of families want to leave some le level of legacy to their their children, and so making sure that some of that protection planning in place helps assure that there's a higher probability of leaving, uh, you know, a family legacy to the next generation. Right. So, so I, I do have to still go back. I know the tax thing was a. Uh, was uh, was of interest and you were looking for, but what what made you take a chance on a uh, a, a startup firm? You know, I'm just curious. Well, I think the first couple of years it was primarily just the taxes, mm -hmm. but as we developed a relationship, the, the two of us, uh, obviously there was trust involved there, and uh, that that's that's primarily, uh, at least from my point of view, over the years that we were able to. Uh, develop a trusting relationship. Back back then, there was uh, there were some scandals mm -hmm. going on uh, in in uh, the investment firm. Uh, Bernie Madoff was one of them. Yeah, locally and there was Grudadaria. Grudadaria, yeah. that's right, that's right. Uh, and so you know, you have to have trust in who you're allowing to care for your for your hard earned money. Well, that means a lot. Trust that we don't. You know, we're, first of all, very grateful for the you know, trust and confidence, but we don't take that lightly. And I know when, when people interview us and, you know, they, they, you know, I come out of the gate and I will tell them, I mean, there's really two things you need to think about when you pick an advisor. I go, first, you got to have the likability factor. I mean, you know, 
whatever makes you happy in working with someone because you're sharing, usually in our relationships, you're sharing things with us that you're not even sharing with family and friends. So having that likability factor is important. And, and then the second part of that, you know, my advice to people when they're interviewing is make sure that the firm, whether it's a one person firm, you know, 10 person or a big firm, do they have the capabilities, you know, the breadth of service in their offerings to deliver on what you need? So every family is different. Everyone has a different need, different level of complexity. So I try to keep it easy for when people do interview is like, you know, narrow it down first. Who do you really like? Because you're, you're going to invest time in a long-term relationship. You know, we've been together 30 years. 30 years, right. So that obviously that's the case with us. And then the second is, you know, does the company have the capability? And then that increases the confidence level that they can, you know, deliver on, on the promises that they're helping you, you know, make for yourself. Yeah. So, so as a consumer, though, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I look at things from our standpoint. I always try to put myself in the in the consumer's shoes, but I'm biased because it's, it's obviously I know the in the industry. I know the difference. You know, our industry is I don't say plagued, but there's a lot of players. There's the banks. There are CPA firms. Um, you have property and casualty companies. You have the big warehouses. Then you have the independents like ourselves. So. What are the challenges you think, not only for yourself, but consumers in general, when trying to select a wealth management firm and you're looking at all these things, what are what 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 do you find a challenge with the bombardment of you know media advertisement, internet streaming and everything else? How how do you feel as a consumer and you know how how as an industry can we make it easier for you? Wow, that's a hard question. I know. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, I it's a hard question because I could largely ignore it, mm -hmm. the bombardment, because I'm happy with where I'm at. If I was starting new, I'm not sure how I would navigate it. To be honest, I, I don't have a, a great answer for that okay. because you're right, there's, there's all kinds. I mean, I, I get in the mail just at least once a week an invitation to dinner <laughs> to go. The clean plate lickety cup. Yeah. And calm. Yeah. I, an invitation to go to a nice restaurant with my wife. And listen to a sales pitch, right? Uh, for a financial planner, and you know we haven't gone to one yet. That makes me feel good. Yeah, I'd be glad to take you out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's but uh, you know I don't I don't know how I would navigate it. I don't have a good answer for you. No, well, I, but I think that's I think what you're saying is what we see as a challenge when we have people come in. The it, it's just there's so much noise. Um, so that's the benefit, you know, the internet. It's harder to hide things. I mean, all the information's out there, but there's so much of it. And then, you know, how people are advertising, how people are trying to educate, not all that information is accurate. Everyone assumes everything on the internet is right, mm -hmm. uh, which it isn't. Uh, and so as a consumer, the, the challenge you, you just stated is, is I think, the, the problem with the industry. It's gotten so complex. Um, not only there are more financial vehicles out there. I mean, insurances, there's so many variations of insurance now where you know, 50 years ago, there was basically two types of insurance. Now there's a plethora of insurance out there. Same thing with investments. I mean, there's only, you know, uh, a limited number of stocks available on the exchange, but you have almost five times that in mutual funds. Mm -hmm. So as a consumer, it, it becomes hard. And then, you know, how do you, because we don't, in our industry, until you get to work with someone, we're not like car manufacturers or table manufacturers where someone can touch and feel and see it. A lot of the work we do, some of the realization isn't until three, five, ten years. Like helping you retire a few years earlier than when you planned on retiring, uh, because you were successful at you know saving and you know through the investment results and all the other things you were doing. You guys followed and executed the the plan very well. Mm -hmm. But the, the the challenge for most is, you know, like you said earlier, it's a trust factor. But you know, where do you place that trust? And that I think. That, with all the market confusion, makes it difficult, I think, for consumers. And unfortunately, I think our industry is responsible for that. We've created, you know, the behemoth. And mm -hmm. now you know, we wonder why clients are edgy or don't understand or prospects are edgy or don't understand what, you know, what's going on. You know, our biggest challenge is misinformation. You know, we have clients, hey, did you see this in the paper? Did you read about this? Or they're sending us stuff. And we spend more time trying to demystify the information that's out there so that we can really just focus on, hey, let's just do the work we got to do for you. So that's a good lead. And how do you feel 
you know, about 10 years ago, robo, robo advisors started getting a lot of play time uh, just because there was low expenses and it's just automated. And now this year has been the year of artificial intel- intelligence, AI. And so how do you feel that might impact consumer space or yourself just in general? And I know there's probably not a lot of answers, but I'm just kind of curious from, again, your standpoint. Well, I guess I guess my, my thought on AI is that I don't think that's something that I'll be using, but I could see it might be a tool for uh, professionals on, on on any level. Right. So uh, it, I'm I'm not the person that that is going to use it primarily because I'm tired now. Yeah. But you uh, might might find some uh, some benefit in employing AI in in your industry that might benefit me. Yeah, I mean, I know we are looking at AI as a as a tool or a resource. It's no different than when the internet became of age back in the 1990s. I was oh my, God, the internet, and you can search and look at things. And people were skeptical back then. I think you know until there's proof, everyone's going to be skeptical. But I think the, the question is, can you use it as a tool to enhance the client experience? Can you use it as a tool to deal with a lot of mundane work? So that it frees up the advisor to spend more time on the client or mm-hmm. um, uh, more time on, on more challenging, you know, challenging projects. But I, I mean, I, I know you just recently retired, but have you seen AI trying to impact the legal space? I mean, I imagine, I remember in the days we, as a CPA, we used to use LexisNexis, which I think is something the attorneys use as well. Yeah, right. But AI is, you know, vastly different. It is. It's a research tool. Right now, research slash plagiarism tool. <laughs> uh, you can, uh, you can. Uh, our industry, there are seminars all the time uh, that talk about AI, mm-hmm. uh, and it's gotten to the point now that you can get briefs. You could say, "Can you write me a brief on this subject?" And they'll write a court brief. Wow! And you know, it's order plagiarism, I guess. I'm not sure, but yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't know how to take it. I mean, you, you know, you set the parameters, but you're pulling the information from someplace, right? Right. And someone may have written something about it and they pulled out a paragraph or an excerpt. Uh, I, I guess that would be considered plagiarism or would it be considered research? No different than if you pull up a court case and you cite a court case, I guess. Right. I don't know. I'm not an attorney, but I'm trying to think along those lines. Well, that, that's, that's where the tricky part gets, is, okay. you know, what part of that brief are you using, and where where was that information drawn from? Okay, uh, it's the reasoning. You know, it's it's become more sophisticated in being able to reason from those court cases and the, the findings of prior courts that uh, AI is getting better at. I guess, yeah. but I'm a dinosaur, so <laughs> I I still like it. Doing things the old fashioned way. Yeah. So. Well, there's something about holding a piece of paper than looking at a glowing you know, computer screen. But yeah, I, I, without question, AI will f- have a space in every industry. Um, it's not going to be just legal or financial planning or even accounting. Um, I think every industry is going to figure out how do I use it as a tool to either improve service, improve productivity, uh, or even improve the, the advice, is get, advice is given. Because if you can pull information and see examples of things that might make your decision time and, and how the conclusions you draw quicker. Yeah. So, so one one last question, unless we got other things we could we want to chat about. So over the last thirty years, you know, you and, and Leslie have gone through different stages of of, of you know life. Um, how has our team at Return on Life Wealth Management helped you through these different stages? You know, you mentioned how you know you started and you moved to Brexville. You didn't have a lot because you invested in a new house. Right. And then, you know, now you retired a couple of years earlier and uh, are are looking forward to a trip to Maui and having some fun. Yeah. Well, Leslie, as you know, she would have all her money in a mattress if (laughs) if she could. Um, And so, uh, but we've, we've been able to uh, sack away enough money that we don't have to worry about our future. That's great. And uh, that's, that's something that, you know, throughout our marriage, it's nice to be able to get, you know, 40 years into it and relax, yeah. you know, and relax and know, know that we don't have to worry about money and we could take our vacations and do the things that we want to do. And retirement is going to be a pleasant thing for yeah, us. Yeah, especially with, you know, uh, one grandchild, uh, 
in, in play, and maybe who knows, a few more down the road. Yeah, God no, 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 no pressure on Brian and Olivia, right? Yeah. <laughs> no more than I put on them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I want to thank you and Leslie one for again all the the trust and confidence and all the years we've worked together, going through the life stages, all the you know meetings we've had every year to make sure things are on track, answer the questions, and even going through some tough times when the you know the markets put a lot of pressure on you know investors when we went through. Uh, wow! Well, I mean, we've been we went through the dot com together. Mm-hmm. We went through the Great Recession together, and then we went through you know COVID slash you know the Fed you know increasing interest rates through the roof in the shortest amount of time and dumping the market both in bonds and stocks in 2022. So we you know we've seen a lot of the stuff, and we you know we've navigated it together. And you know your trust and confidence. That's the hardest part is when when the media and the markets create such a fear it, it it makes it difficult for clients to to make more of a what we call a rational decision because we're all irrational people at, at some at some point and so you know depending on whatever whatever one's floor is in dealing with risk you know some people will raise the white right i call it the white flag sooner than later yeah. and so keeping people committed to their plan which is what you you and Leslie did you've committed to the plan is you know Played out very well, so we're very happy for you. So, well, thank you for for all you've done for us. Uh, it's been an honor. And Tim, thanks for joining me today. It was thoroughly enjoyable to go down memory lane. Uh, now we're, we're dating ourselves, you know, thir- thirty years. Um, and again, thank you and Leslie for your continued trust and confidence in me and the Return on Life Wealth Partners team. Uh, and thank you to all our listeners who took the time today to join us and to uh, partake in our conversation. If you'd like to learn more about how Return on Life Wealth Partners can help you pursue your important life goals, give us a call at 440-740-0130 or visit visit us online at returnonlifewealthpartners.com. May everyone have a, a happy and healthy 2024. Take care. This has been Frank Wealth Insights, the financial and investment podcast from Return on Life Wealth Partners. Your life, your money, your way. Experience financial planning the way it should be, not the way they want it. See how at returnonlifewealth.com. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. This communication expresses the views and opinions of the participants as of the date it was recorded or indicated, and such views are subject to change without notice. This podcast is being made available for educational purposes only and should not be confused for any other purpose. The information contained herein does not constitute and should not be construed as an offering of advisory services or an offer to sell or solicitation to buy any securities or related financial interests instruments in any jurisdiction. This podcast may discuss forward-looking statements that are based on then-current beliefs of the participants. Investment advice offered through Planned Financial Services, a registered investment advisor.